In the video, The Most Dangerous Places on the Planet, we told you about the Tunguska incident. Many of you expressed a desire for us to develop this topic in more detail. What happened on June 30th, 1908, in one of the most sparsely populated areas in Yakusha? Why did Nikola Tesla make multiple requests to the Library of Congress for geographic maps of sparsely populated areas in Siberia days before the explosion? If indeed the explosion was caused by a meteorite body or a cometary remnant, why have neither meteorite debris nor the casing of this huge impact, whose airwaves circled the globe twice, been found? And a million more questions. The answers to what really happened, why, who, and what he is hiding, we will look for in this video. What happened in Yakusha, Russia on June 3, 1908 has been called many different things. However, in our opinion, the Tunguska event most accurately defines the incident, an event of an unexplained nature for which no one has given an adequate explanation for more than 100 years. What do we actually know for sure happened? Since June 27, 1908, unusual atmospheric phenomena have been observed throughout Europe, from the Atlantic to the Urals, all the way to Western Siberia, silvery clouds, sun halo, bright light sky during nightfall. The northern part of the sky has a reddish tint and the eastern greenish. British astronomer William Denning recorded that the sky over Bristol on the night of June 30th was anomalously bright in the north. Just then, on June 30th, 1908, New Style, and June 17th, 1908, Old Style, local Aborigines and Russian settlers in the hills northwest of Lake Baikal observed a bluish light. It is described as a moving light as bright as the sun, leaving behind a thin line. Suddenly, lightning strikes, forming a large cloud. Then a pillar of fire appears, lighting up the entire horizon in red. The pillar then splits into two parts and fades to a black color. About 10 minutes later, shots were fired as if from artillery fire. Those near the explosion said the source of the sound moved from east to north relative to their position, and the accompanying shockwave knocked people down and shattered windows hundreds of kilometers away. The event was recorded by seismic centers across Eurasia. Airwaves from the blast were reported in Germany, Denmark, Croatia, and the United Kingdom as far away as Indonesia and Washington. In some places, the wave was equivalent to an earthquake with a magnitude of 5 on the Richter scale. During the next few nights, the sky in Asia and Europe was unusually bright. There are reports of brightly lit pictures taken at midnight without the aid of a flash in Sweden and Scotland. Although the area of Siberia where the explosion occurred was very sparsely populated in 1908, there is evidence of the event from eyewitnesses who were in the vicinity at the time and regional newspapers reported the event shortly after it occurred. We can get the most realistic idea of the scale of this event from the records of what some of the eyewitnesses said. S. Semenov told the Russian mineralogist Leonid Kulik's expedition in 1930 the following. At breakfast, as he sat by the house at the Vanavera trading post, about 65 kilometers, 40 miles south of the explosion, he suddenly noticed that to the north, over Tunguska's Onkel Road, the sky split in two, and a fire appeared over the forest. The rift in the sky widens, and the entire northern side is engulfed in fire. At this moment, he begins to feel unbearable heat. He shared that he was so hot, he thought he wouldn't last. He felt like his shirt was burning on him. Shortly after, the sky closes, a loud crash is heard, and Simonov is thrown a few meters away. He lost consciousness for a moment, but his wife appeared and led him to the house. Then he heard a noise like stones falling or cannons being fired, and the earth shook. Later, they saw that many of the windows were broken and some of the iron locks on the barns were broken. Testimony of a man from the Shanyagir tribe. The story was recorded by I. M. Suslov in 1926. My brother Chekharin and I had a hut by the river. As we were sleeping, suddenly we were both awakened it was as if someone pushed us. We heard whistling and felt a strong wind. Chekharin asked me if I could hear all those birds flying over our heads. We were both inside the hut and could not see what was happening outside. Suddenly something pushed me again 
much louder this time. Already very frightened, we began to call our father, our mother, and our other brothers, but no one answered. Outside the hut, we could hear the trees falling. Chekarin and I wanted to run away, but then the first thunder struck. The ground began to move. The air wave hit our hut and overturned it. Then I saw what was happening outside. The trees were falling, their branches were burning. It became so bright, as if there was a second sun, and my eyes hurt so much that I had to close them. And again there was a loud thunder. My brother and I got out from under the remains of the hut. We saw another flash of lightning followed by a loud crash. The wind came again, passed through us, and knocked us over, then passed through the fallen trees. We saw the tops of fallen trees being torn off. We watched the fires. Suddenly Chekarin shouted, Look up! I looked and saw another flash that produced another thunder. It was the fourth hit, but it was further away, and it felt normal. Similar stories were also published in the Sabir newspaper on July 2, 1908, and the Krasnoyarets newspaper on July 13, 1908. What does the research show? After the 1908 event, about 1,000 scientific articles related to the Tunguska explosion were published, most of them in Russian. Due to the remoteness of the site and the limitation of the technique to study such an event, most scientific interpretations of the causes and magnitude are based mainly on studies conducted many years after the event. Estimates of the energy of the blast range from 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. An analysis of the region was only carried out after more than a decade. In 1921, the Russian mineralogist Leonid Kulik led a team in the basin of the Podkamina Tunguska River. Numerous local accounts of the event led Kulik to believe that the explosion was caused by a giant meteorite impact. He convinced the Soviet government to finance an expedition to the alleged impact zone. In 1927, Kulik led a scientific expedition to the site of the Tunguska explosion. Local Evink hunters direct the team to the epicenter of the blast, where they expect to find an impact crater. To their surprise, there was no crater at the point of the impact. Instead, they found an area about 5 miles 8 kilometers in diameter where the trees were charred and had no branches but were still standing. Trees that were farther from the center were particularly burned and felled toward the center, creating a large radial pattern. In the 1960s, the area of the fallen forest was found to cover an area of 2,150 kilometers squared, 830 square miles, shaped like a giant outstretched butterfly with a wingspan of 70 kilometers and a body length of 55 kilometers. In the next 10 years, three more expeditions were conducted in the area. Kulik organized an aerial survey of the area, covering the central part of the flattened forest. 1,500 negatives with photographs were made. All of them, however, were burned in 1975 by order of Yevgeny Krinov, then chairman of the Committee on Meteorites of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR as part of the initiative to destroy flammable nitrate films. The positive prints have been preserved for further study in the Russian city of Tomsk. Researcher John Anfinoganov hypothesized that the boulder found at the site, known as John Stone, was a remnant of the meteorite. But oxygen isotope analysis of the quartzite indicated that it was of hydrothermal origin and possibly related to the Permian-Triassic magmatism of the Siberian Trap. The leading scientific explanation for the explosion is the explosion of a meteorite between 6 to 10 kilometers above the Earth's surface. In 2020, a group of Russian scientists, through a computer simulation, used a number of assumptions about the composition, trajectory, and size of the object. The model that most closely matches the observed event was an iron asteroid with a diameter of 200 meters, moving at a speed of 11 kilometers per second. The effect of the explosion on the trees near the hypocenter of the explosion is similar to the effect of a conventional blast operation. That is, the trees immediately below the explosion are exposed as the blast wave travels vertically downwards but remain upright, while trees further away are felled as the blast wave travels horizontally as it reaches them. But, if this theory is true, how is there not a particle of this 200-meter metallic asteroid left? 
Another version of what happened after the explosion can be found in the stories of the local population, who purposefully avoided a large perimeter from the center of the event. Before the happening, their hunters used to pass through this area. Eyewitnesses claim that there is, dug into the ground, a huge copper cauldron, or as the locals call it, the Iron House. The hunters, sometimes if necessary, spend the night in these rooms, which kept summer heat in the bitter cold. However, this did not have a good effect on their health. They fell seriously ill, and if anyone spent the night there again, he died. Eyewitnesses say that there is a flattening arch protruding above the ground, under which there are many metal rooms. Traditions of the area claim that on the 100th anniversary of the event in the valley, a huge torch of fire sprang up from under the ground and burned everything alive within a radius of 100 meters. Locals called the bank of the Velui River Algi Timurbit, which translates as Big Sunken Cauldron. There, indeed, was a giant cauldron of copper. The size could not be established, since only its edge was visible above the ground, but several trees grew in it. This was recorded by the naturalist, educator, and researcher Richard Karlovich Mack in 1853 in his notes. The Experiment of Tesla In a workbook of the Serbian-American scientist Nikola Tesla, which was bequeathed to be open 100 years after the explosion, it was written that this was his experiment. The notebook is now kept in his museum in Belgrade. According to a study conducted by Associate Dr. Onion Y. Kamenov, head of the department at Technical University, Sofia, who examines in detail American, Russian, etc. publications, the phenomenon is a direct result of Tesla's research. The New York Sun reported on December 30, 1907, half a year before the explosion, about an upcoming experiment by engineer Nikola Tesla in Siberia. He studied the Earth's electromagnetic field from the Wardenclyffe Experimental Tower on Long Island to central Siberia. In the last days before the explosion, he made numerous requests to the Library of Congress for geographic maps of the least populated areas in Siberia. In his notes, Tesla notes, May 1, 1908, engaging number one, Huge flashes of light are seen over Europe, from London and Paris to the Urals. June 27, 1908. Light intensifies and moves from the Baltic to the Urals. Glowing orbs fly to eastern Siberia. June 29, 1908. Fire number 11. Three pulses 60 seconds apart. That was a blast. The wave reached New York. A monstrous burst of natural electricity occurred in Siberia. After the explosion, in several press conferences, Tesla announced that he had carried out a series of experiments on the wireless transmission of ring-shaped electrical impulses. Russian media RTR Planeta quoted him as saying, It is quite possible to transmit energy without wires and achieve destructive results from a distance. I have already constructed such a wireless transmitter. Is that all that happened? Has the experiment brought in uninvited guests? Wasn't the very purpose to open a galactic link? What are these metal rooms that sicken and kill the locals? Isn't it an object that hit the earth so hard that it dug into it, and the object itself or something in it is radioactive to us? Does anyone currently have the formula for wireless energy transfer and extraction from nature? There are thousands of questions but logical and proven answers are still missing. You can find more interesting knowledge in our channel. Don't forget to support us by sharing this video and subscribing to the channel.